think there are other trail towns that do this, but uh, where you actually walk through town, they actually have the AT placards in the sidewalk. So Hot Springs is obviously one of those. And being a relative purist in the sense that the definition of a through hike is that you do the entirety of the trail within 12 months. I don't skip uh, the, even the little sections if I can help it. I just think that once you start doing that, skipping a quarter mile becomes a half mile, becomes a mile, becomes 10. Although it's probably controversial, I don't obviously don't stay away from those issues. I think I would guess based on what I see so far is that about 50% of the people who claim through hiker status at the end of the year, uh, about 50% um, are actually have done the entirety of the trail. There's a lot of folks who are, you know, will skip sections or whatever. And, you know, there's still long distance hiking and God bless them. They're still doing big miles, but they're skipping significant sections. Usually folks who live in an area and have already done it a bunch of times and um, so they're just going around sections that they've done, which yeah, they're going to end up doing the whole trail. It's just not really a through hike um, given the fact that it's not within the same 12 months. But for me, since I haven't done really any of the trail other than areas that I'd grown up in, um, then it's sort of easier to be a purist and just keeping to the fact that I have to do the whole thing. So, oh, down this way, just to give you so I said Spring Creek. Remember that I talked about the tavern? I thought it was silver. No, it's Spring Creek Tavern there. Uh, this, I think it's been closed. I'm not sure. This Hot Springs Creekside Court Motel. They have, I think they have like live bands there or something, but not while I was here. ATMs, a couple of them down here, and then one at the gas station that we had passed farther down. Then this is the library. That's where the Wi-Fi is so good. So if you need Wi-Fi, that is definitely the place to go. It is awesome. And so when you're leaving Hot Springs, you uh, will see that it is marked. You just continue to go across the uh, railroad tracks. There is a break in the guardrail that you cut through. That's what I was, what was explained to me. So I'll look for it here and then uh, I'll get back to you when we actually hit dirt. I think it must be obviously one of these hills that we're heading up today. It looks like the profile coming out of here is um, a stair climb up to elevation and then sort of ridge running. A lot of ups and downs, but I think there are two sizable elevation climbs today. I'm looking to go to somewhere around Laurel Shelter, which is 19.7. Um, if I fall short, no problem. Basically, because there's so many uh, hikers, we get concentrated here and then we leave. I mean, there's probably 30 people that are going to leave today. Uh, what I think uh, the profile is, I'll probably follow, is to look to stealth camp and not concentrate as much around the shelters as I had in the past, even though I wasn't using the shelters. Maybe a couple miles before or after a shelter. The nice thing about coming, dropping off a little bit before a shelter is the fact that in the morning, uh, before you really get going, 
you can kind of hit the privy on the way through and that's really convenient instead of go chasing cat holes see here's where I'm a little confused it says but they said go across the French Broad River so I just don't see any markers along here so anyway the uh back to the point is yeah all of us have to sort of make a decision about how we're going to manage uh the the bubble and even though we are technically in front of like the march 1st bubble there are a few people but the march 1st bubble um still we get concentrated particularly here in hot springs and sort of punch out in large numbers together and so boy i wish there was an at sign here oh there's a there's a blaze right there awesome okay um you know how we're going to manage that so postcard i remember said that he would go in eat dinner with a group at a shelter then hike on for another mile or mile, mile and a half or so and stealth camp beyond the shelter uh He's done two through hikes, so got to take that guidance. Um, but like I said, also thinking that if you you stop off a little bit before the shelter, uh, you know it, you do have like privy facilities or something uh, in the morning before you really get um, pushing for the day. Anyway, I'll let you know as. You know, these considerations just become theoretical at the beginning and then as we start to do it and unfold you know i'll let you know what my particular preference has become uh the pack light the pack is pretty light this morning i dumped probably another two pounds got rid of my camp shoes uh, and some other items that's in addition to the four pounds I dropped at um, Gatlinburg. I do have a heavier food um, weight today because we're looking probably five to six days before we hit Irwin. So this is one of the longer stretches without a resupply. But my weight, pack weight, base weight, is definitely lower. I'm just keeping my winter weight closed, and if I need, I if I find that I need camp shoes when it warms back up. Yeah, so you can see, here's the AT. I think it drops down here. Yep. So there's the blaze that tells you the two that tell you AT, and then the top one says turn right. So you can see that they've adjusted the. these barriers in order to allow you to come through okay so I'm gonna start heading down here take care of the sniffles and uh, let you know as things come up I believe that's the broad French River. Pretty this morning. So I'm a little confused. You're looking straight down. I'm not sure how that may seem to you. There are no blazes. And I'm showing you this because it's just like a goat path and it doesn't seem like there's enough of a path that would be consistent with all the people who have hiked the AT coming up this hill. So I'm like half convinced that I'm not on the AT, but I see footprints and pole strikes just enough to convince me that other people have done this. And recently, but there's no, I can't see any blazes and it literally is not even hardly a path. 
it's incredibly steep. I'm gonna swing you over. Maybe you'll get a better sense. So this would be horizontal, so you can see how steeply it drops off. That's looking up the hill. And again, where, where, I don't know where the path is, like that. Looks like where people are sliding, but there's no blazes. I mean, in all honesty, you know my feelings about North Carolina, and if we were in any other state, I would be absolutely convinced that I have somehow gotten off the AT on that. But I must admit, I am completely perplexed right now. If I'm on the AT or somehow, gut hook says I'm on it, or I'm so close to it that it's, that it, um, you know, has me in immediate proximity. It doesn't say I'm off the trail. Anyway, I'm gonna go up this hill, try to figure it out, and I'll let you know when I, when I do. Well, it's a beautiful day. I just hate, I'm looking to do 19.7 today. My knee is still a little sensitive. I got a knee brace to provide it greater support, um, but it's still pretty sensitive. So that climbing on hands and knees up that hill didn't help. And while it's not really problematic per se right now, I could see how, you know, in 12 miles, that little bit of strain could compound into a, uh, you know, a bit of a knee issue. So. Anyway, it really is a beautiful morning. The weather's supposed to turn to crap again, of course, for the next two days. So I'd like to get some miles in today because I don't know what I'll be able to do in the cold rain that is forecasted. So, well, lessons learned. What I'll do is uh, get my act together here, get some water in me, and uh, start pushing some miles. And I'll get back to you when I see something of particular note. So, of course, needless to say, I'm beating myself up about that act of stupidity crawling up that hill on my hands and knees when clear that wasn't the AT and I was sort of thinking why I didn't stop much earlier and go back and you know, I was thinking in when you learn to fly and you go from visual flight rules to instrument flight rules, they put a hood on you so that you can't see out of the window from the cockpit. And, you know, you're relying on the needle, the airspeed, the ball, you know, telling you your attitude relative to the horizon, your airspeed, and your direction of travel. And when you're diving, you know, bubbles always go up, and your dive computer is telling you, giving you the information about, you know, your time, depth, all that sort of thing. And you're taught, it's beaten into you when your sensory perception is giving you conflicting data. Rely on the instruments. So, you know, I erroneously did that with gut hooks. The arrow was indicating that I was close enough to the AT that some of the arrow was touching it until all of a sudden it wasn't. But 
the thing with gut hooks is, you know, you learn it's sort of quirkiness. Like I said, um, that I've had it come up and give me what appeared to be a set location that was clearly miles off. And I don't know, maybe I don't fully understand the gut hooks app, um, but I don't see an indicator on gut hooks when it doesn't have at least a triangulation, GPS triangulation of your location. In other words, a good lock. My arrow is always red. It doesn't, for example, turn green when it has a good lock on me. My little GPS box on the lower right hand corner is red, meaning G GPS function is off until I push it, telling the system, I want you to tell me where I am. And as soon as you push it, it goes green no matter whether it has a solid lock on you or not. And a little blue reticle comes up and it always comes up. So there doesn't, and then you have a little dialogue box giving you your name, your miles along your saved route or mile on the AT elevation. I don't see anything that says, you know, I don't have a good lock on you. So the information that I'm giving you as an estimator is not as accurate. And um, that could probably be adjusted by gut hook would be a worthwhile ch modification. Um, and maybe one of you guys will correct me that there is something I'm missing. Um, on the positive side, let me move you over. My arm gets tired, boys, my arm gets tired. So anyway, pretty happy guys. Cannot be unhappy in a situation like this, I'll tell you. So I hope you're having a good day. And again, as we continue along, interesting sights, I'll bring them up for you. Nice little pond here. With an old dam. Again, not sure these pictures will come out, but has some pretty tall peaks over there. That one, I don't know if we've already gone over that, if we're about to, but I can't imagine that they would let that one go without us having the opportunity to hike up it. unique things to the trail today. Uh, it's been real sunny and, and nice. Uh, I did just come out of the last shelter, first shelter up here and uh, it's up like 11.2 miles and ran into the Yukon Rasputin. So Seemed like a good guy and he's been, I think he's met just about the whole crew, our crew, the uh, Pee Wee and PT, Jeep. Yeah, a bunch of the guys, so it was nice to meet him. So, he, you got a picture maybe you'll put it up on his site anyway um just chilling today i think i'm gonna go to we're supposed to have the storm come in tonight start tonight it'll run through tomorrow uh but i think in order to avoid the wet gear i am going to step off at the 16.7 mile mark and go to the Hemlock Hostel. Uh, 
So I'll tell you about that. Let you know how it is. Gets great reviews. Um, just 23 bucks with tax. So I think what I will do is step off there and just spare myself the cold, wet gear in the morning. But then, of course, continue on tomorrow. I mean, I don't mind hiking in the rain. But if I can avoid getting all my gear wet, that would be a, uh, a real... So. All right, this is where the AT comes down and hits Asheville Road at the... Cherokee National Forest.